welcome back to afternoon session, cohort two. Who's driving in from San Francisco, if anybody? Okay, there's like five of you. There's like four, three or four people who are taking the Cal trains every day, like today, and they leave at you know, the first Caltrain leaves at 8.15 in the morning and gets here at like 9.30, so like, they miss everything. And you probably want them on your team, too. <laughs> Will you self-identify if you're taking Caltrains in? There's like five, five. Would any of you be willing to like talk to them to see if you can hook up and coordinate? So who's driving in again who might be able to... Less hands, that's okay. <laughs> Did everybody see somebody who you might? Is there a mailing list for the gas? Though? There is now a Slack, so most, that's a great idea. So what we'll do is we'll create a channel called transportation, okay? <coughs> I'll try to help out there, guys, but it's mainly going to be you guys figuring out how to meet up and hook up. Maybe offer to pay for gas for the other person. Some people might want carpool from the East Bay. So. Carpool from the East Bay, yep. I'm East Bay, but I come here at four in the morning to <laughs> shine the silver. So without further ado, I'd like to invite to the stage Tom Ding from Coinify, who will present. And um, I wanted Tom to give this lecture because it's one, it's brilliant. He's brilliant. Coinify is amazing. But to give you also a sense of where you can build blockchain apps. In what space? What are, what are the dimensions? What are the parameters of the space and all? I think he sheds a lot of light in this area. So, Tom. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Tom. Welcome to the class two of Blockchain U and uh, Cohort Two. Uh, very excited to present to you some of the learnings I had in the last uh, year while working on Coinify. Uh, we are a blockchain based application platform. Um, so, you know, kind of give you a bigger context. I understand that I think in the morning, you guys have been looking, learning a lot about the Bitcoin stuff, but I just want to give you a broader context. Um, so, let's talk about decentralized application. How many of you are familiar with the concept of decentralized application here? All right. Can anyone please give me a one-line description of what do you think is a decentralized application? It's a very fuzzy term, but anyone want to give it a try? Just go ahead. There's no, there's no central authority that can that is needed for this system to work. Okay. No central authority. Um, any other different angles, perspectives? Thank you. Yes. Uh, every part of the infrastructure for the uh, for the application is in a sense replaceable. People can come in and contribute to it. Everyone can contribute to the application. Yeah. There's, there's no authority based. Um, Providers. Got it. Okay. Anything? Any other different views about the essential application? Yes. They're peer to peer, meaning each node or client is both like a client and a server at the same time. Got it. So it's a peer to peer structured architecture yes. application. Right. Got it. Cool. So most of what we're hearing around without authority, peer to peer, and free to contribute. Uh, I think that captured part of that. Uh, there's no formal definition. I don't have formal definition either. But let's look at from probably a couple of uh, primitives at what would probably be interesting as a decentralized application. Um, so here's a, like a list of things that try to summarize what exactly makes the Bitcoin blockchain or the original idea of blockchain kind of interesting um, and fascinating uh, from the very basic both perspective, but also uh, properties, but also primitives. Uh, the first one is a consensus-based state machine. Uh, do you have, everybody understand the idea of a state machine? So it's basically there's a trying to maintain a unified or steady state, right? It's a state machine. And when you think about Bitcoin blockchain, it essentially what it does is really maintaining the latest state of who owns how much Bitcoin, right? That's a state machine. And it's responsible for the transition of these different states. Um, the second is obviously the Bitcoin blockchain, we, as we all know today, is designed in a way such that it's all replicated across many different machines. So it's a redundant, right? And now that it's redundant, it also makes it harder for people to reverse. So that kind of helps the first property as well. The third one is it's transparent and shared logic. What that means is that not only the state itself is transparent, but also the logic that maintains, say, who can spend the money, who cannot spend the money, is also very transparent, the logic. Um, and the other two is kind of related is 
The first is native store value, the so-called on-chain assets. I'll explain a little bit later what that means. But it essentially means is Bitcoin is created out of nothing, right? It's an on-chain asset that does not exist before. And I would almost argue that kind of paradigm, it's not really technology, but it's a paradigm that doesn't quite exist before um, um, as an on-chain. And the other related concept is tokenization. Now we're talking about, probably some of you already heard of that, on a Bitcoin, uh, not only there's the Bitcoin, but there are also assets like gold or you know, uh, um, precious metals that exist uh, as, a, as an entry on Bitcoin blockchain, but they do not necessarily represent something that's on a blockchain. The gold it is a physical gold, right? so it's an off-chain asset. Um, so these are some of the interesting properties and primitives and, and paradigms that kind of introduced by the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, but the most, the most important thing probably is really about the consensus-based state machine. So let's deep dive in a little bit. And that's probably what constitutes, I think, is the core of the distributed applications. So um, a few different concepts, a few more basic concepts to introduce. Probably we all, I guess, I suppose everyone is familiar with the difference between the big B and the small B, right? The Bitcoin, the currency, and Bitcoin, the ledger, or the protocol. Um, the other, the second one is we should talk about decentralized application. Um, as I said, you know, there's a couple different angles to define the essential application, uh, but the most important one is probably the consensus of states, that there is a finality or there's a, uh, a unity of a state that's presented. Um, and the related, the other one is DAO. So instead of looking at a piece, just piece of software, um, a DAO could also be considered as something that when you think about Bitcoin, and these miners are really doing the work for the network, they're kind of an employee of a Bitcoin Incorporated, right? So it's kind of a decentralized organization. The cool thing about the DAO is that there's no CEO per se. It's based on a consensus, right? The whole organization works on consensus. There's no firing, no hiring. Everybody's free to join. Everybody's free to leave. Um, that's a cool thing about um, as a DAO. Um, the other concept is smart contract. Smart contract is a usual name that we kind of give to uh, one of the primitives of here is uh, the transparent and shared logic. Is how the Bitcoin transitions the ledger transition from state A to state B. How does Bob starting only 100 Bitcoin to 120 Bitcoin because Alice gave him an extra Bitcoins that just stay transitioned there? How is that governed? It's governed by something called smart contract. It's a piece of code, as you would see in the Bitcoin under uh, the scripting in forced language, right? Um, and the last one is on-chain and off-chain assets. As we talked about, on-chain are something that exists only and exclusively on the ledger, right? The Bitcoin, Dogecoin, Litecoin, all of them does not have a form outside the chain. That's the only source of truth, and plus there's no other manifestation. Versus something like gold or securities, you could record them on a Bitcoin blockchain or any blockchain, but they do not, the only, the, their final state is really exists outside the world, right? outside the chain world. So, here's some basic concepts. Any questions so far? Yeah, cool. Now, let's look at the decentralized application. What constructs a decentralized application? And I'm trying to reuse a form that's probably pretty familiar to most of us, at least from a technical perspective, the NVC model, right? We have the model, the view, the controller. Controller, uh, the model is basically the data storage or um, you know, the, the schema that represents some logic. Controller manages what kind of thing can go into the model, what kind of can change that. And the view is what presented to the user experience. Um, so in a typical world, you would basically have view, model, and controller. Now what's the additional in the DApp stack is really the, the left side. You have the model and controller, but you also have a, it's something but a consensus critical. Meaning that not, not necessarily all part of your uh, application is consensus critical. Some of them are just very local. Um, well, I'll give you a few more examples later on, um, but some part of that might be very consensus critical. And that usually has something to do with either like Bitcoin when you have a financial stake, right? You can't just say, I have 100 Bitcoin. You have need the consensus of the rest of the network to say, to agree that you have um, the assets. Um, and as you can see, the controller part is really what we can call a smart contract, um, as mapped to the traditional technical term. And then behind that, you have a consensus layer that stores both the controller um, and the state itself. So that's a little bit um, abstract. Let, let's probably look at a few more examples later on and explain this model a bit more. But that's kind of, a, you know, arguably the D app is not really fundamentally different from the traditional application. It's really an addition of a consensus critical component that that component really needs to be lived across different computers and be agreed upon by multiple parties. Does that all make sense so far? 
Um, now, one thing I would like to expand a little bit is what it, uh, there are different ways of achieving consensus. Um, I think what probably you guys are starting to get familiar with is the Bitcoin way of achieving consensus or achieving certainty. Um, now, there are, that's not the only way, and there's a cost that we pay in order to achieve that kind of finality. Um, so, here's a diagram that I borrow from Richard Brown, who is an executive architect from IBM UK. So, he kind of outlines what are the different trust models that um, in order to achieve a certain finality or consensus. Um, on the left side, you have a central authority that we're very familiar with. You have, let's say, the central banks, the custodian banks, commercial banks, which says, how much asset do you own in my bank? And then all the way to the right, you have nobody. Basically, trust. you don't need to trust anyone. You just trust the network will tell you how many exactly Bitcoin or Litecoin you have. And that's the typical example, obviously, being Bitcoin. That's the kind of uh, the horizontal access. The vertical access is in terms of whether it's an on-chain assets, meaning the, the asset exists on, on a chain itself, uh, versus it's off-platform or some even more complicated obligations uh, like you know, securities, derivatives, and all that stuff. Um, so there's a spectrum of that. Um, and I think the, the, the recent development in the cryptocurrency world in general is a, um, a merging between the traditional finance world, which is very much in a central authority way, way um, and a complete nobody way. People are starting to see uh, a middle ground between these two branches. But in general, you could look at basically Bitcoin being an extreme or any type of Bitcoin um, kind of a derivative being the, the extreme of trusting nobody, where you trust a collective miner. You do not trust, you do not know any specific miners but he trusts the network as a whole has a certain level of security. And that is based on a model that in order to reverse the network, you need hundreds of millions of dollars of buying the mining machines in order to reverse a certain transaction. That's one way. Um, and the other way is, can we borrow some of that properties and say, what if we already, already know these people? We know it's Bank of America that's executing certain transaction. We know it's a collective, let's say, a 100 bank, commercial banks in the US are collectively forming a network. In that case, do we really need that kind of uh, uh, very high-stake mining per se, right? We probably don't really need that because we know their legal identity, we know how to penalize them when, when certain things happen. So what we really need is consensus um, between these companies, and hence we will have a much more cost-effective solution that does not cost uh, mining. So that's one thing I kind of wanted to bring into perspective because as we, as you guys try to build in interesting applications, uh, you want to be clear about what exactly you want it to be um, in terms of the choices of the chains. You could build your own chain or a collective uh, consensus networks, or you could say, um, I could put everything on a Bitcoin-like network. And there are trade-offs there, right? The trade-offs is really between cost, efficiency, speed, confirmation time, um, and also whether what kind of use case are you trying to build. Uh, in this case, you could clearly see for the uh, on-chain assets, the anonymous cases like Bitcoin probably makes more sense uh, because the assets only exist on the chain, right? So long as these people collectively exclusively agree, uh, it means that the asset is whatever the state they say is. Versus when you have an off-chain asset, it doesn't really make sense necessarily in all cases to have an anonymous miner to tell you who owns the gold when he doesn't really represent, he doesn't own the gold, custodian gold itself. So then it makes sense to actually the guy who has an interest in that gold asset uh, to hold it. Um, so, all right. Any questions so far? Been on? So let's talk about a few examples of the different type of blockchain-based applications. Some of the applications are the applications that we at Quantify work with, so that hopefully that makes give you a more concrete sense of what can be built on a blockchain. Some of them are a pure blockchain-based application. Some of them a, a, are a uh, kind of a marriage between the traditional application and, and a blockchain-based application. Uh, the first one is Facta. So what block, Bitcoin blockchain does is a um, timestamping mechanism. But you have a data layer. Uh, the cost, one of the costs of that is it's pretty expensive. It costs about one or two cents, I think, right now, based on Bitcoin price, to put an entry into Bitcoin blockchain to make a transaction, regardless of whatever data you put that. So what if a bank's bank, let's say, or a commercial organization wanted to use a time timestamping mechanism and to log large amount of data, millions of records every single day, that's quite a significant cost for a bank in order to leverage that property of irreversibility, right? So what Factum does is they put a meta layer on top of Bitcoin blockchain that is much, much faster um, and also much cheaper. That's one hundredth of the cost, or uh, roughly, um, of, of the Bitcoin blockchain. 
Um, they have one minute confirmation time instead of ten minute confirmation time. Um, and uh, you know, they bas basically viewed a group of separate uh, auditors and validators that are much faster to confirm. But ultimately, um, um, they put a, a hash, a Merkle root hash of all the data that logged and put that, tag that into the Bitcoin blockchain. So essentially enjoy the security, most of the security of the Bitcoin without necessarily having the uh, significant cost trade off of that. So that's one use case of a Bitcoin. So it's kind of more a meta layer on top of Bitcoin blockchain. The other example, a uh, more interesting, more fun example, my favorite example so far for the usage of uh, Bitcoin blockchain or blockchain in general is a game. Playing deck bound cards and deck bound games results in level. Did everybody hear us? We built a service called Bitcoin.io, which we use to type those transactions and denote them as deck bound cards. We also use that transaction to create information about the card, a set of attributes and ranges. If you query Bitcoin.io using a transaction ID, which is effectively the identifier of a card, you can get that list of attributes. The deckbound systems turn that set of attributes into a digital playing card, which you can use in a variety of deckbound games and other games as well. Playing deckbound cards in deckbound games results in leveling transactions being applied to those cards at certain stages and adds experience to your player account, which contributes towards general leveling, augments, and tweaks that you can use across deckbound games. Cards that are leveled up have new tags written to them by the Bitbind.io service, tracking a series of transactions which themselves all represent a single deckbound card. Deckbound cards can be played in multiple games, and there are different mappings of attributes to in-game abilities and parameters. Every card is generated from a Genesis block. The Genesis block provides things like names and art for the cards, and is based on contribution to the deckbound Genesis system. Any interested party can purchase part of a Genesis block, and every time a card is sold from that block, they're paid 25% of the sale price. We've intentionally built the Bitbind.io service and the deckbound API as open systems that can be used by players, programmers, and anybody else, whether it be to extend the deckbound games, build different games, or architect entirely different applications. The Bitbind.io service is designed to sit alongside the Bitcoin blockchain and provide extensibility for a number of application spaces. For more information about everything discussed in this video, check out deckbound.com or bitbind.io for more information about the Bitbind service. So basically a blockchain based game um, um, that essentially puts game card or I assume most people are familiar with trading card game, right? It's a, it's scarce, it has to be unique, and et cetera, right? So that's basically kind of like a financial assets in a game world. Um, so essentially that uses the Bitcoin's properties uh, to record and uh, control, track all the movements of different trading card games. So that's a really interesting use case. Um, they are, uh, the whole, they actually, in order to develop a game, the guy, Garrett, the founder, uh, decided to move to Isle of Men in order to get all the regulatory for treatment of uh, a wild man. So it's kind of interesting, side note. So, that's deck bound. Um, another really interesting example uh, that I think is going to launch hopefully soon, a uh, very ambitious project that is going to be based on Ethereum. Um, or mo have most of you heard of Ethereum? That's cool. Um, so Ethereum is a generic, you know, Ethereum complete smart contract platform, and Augur is one of the, I think, a very powerful use cases. What they do is think of a picture this way. Today you do a Google search on um, you know what is the score of a certain team uh, or who is going to be who is the president of the U.S. right now or uh, or the country. Now instead of doing that, you can think of the Google for the future. Uh, you could type in who will be the president in two years in 2016, and um, that's Augur will give you is a probability prediction of what exactly will happen and how that gener generate from is based on the collective voting or betting. Uh, results of the different players on the auger and all of your betting can be done in their own uh, currency so they introduce it not only just a uh, they introduce two classes of interesting tokens one is stable coin so you don't necessarily want to be betting both on the uncertainty of the of the decision itself and also the um, uh, the Bitcoin volatility or ether volatility volatility so they, in, they introduce a new class of coin that trying to peg against a fiat currency and the other type of token is called reputation. 
So the first stage is someone create a vote, say, okay, who's the uh, who's going to be the president in 2016? And after that, everybody you know plays bet on it. When that batting closed, uh, when the event is actually happened by 2016, some people who hold the reputation coin is going to vote, collectively vote on the results of that um, uh, decision, what exactly happened. So the two class of the, the tokens. And when you think about that kind of use case, it's not just about sports betting and you know. Uh, um, political prediction, these kind of obvious use cases, but also could be expended very much to things like weather insurance, right? Insurance is a probability event. So very much you can say a farmer in Kenya could also create a prediction uh, market which says what's the weather like for the next year so that he can hedge the risk against um, the, the weather uh, for his uh, cropping. So, so yeah, so that's Augur and they build a whole system. So obviously in a system like that, uh, there's a couple of things you want to consider. One is uh, censorship resistance. Like, what if some government doesn't like um, the system being used as a way to um, introduce a certain truth and they, they would not like to admit, right? So it needs to be censorship resistant. So the decentralized system makes a lot of sense if you use something like that. And secondly is what if someone trying to gain the results, right? So I bet a lot on certain outcome and I really, re don't really like that result. So it needs to be decentralized enough such that there will be a broad audience of reputation coin holders, and uh, they could collectively decide on, on the right result instead of trying someone trying to gain results. So there's a number of properties that makes a decentralized system really attractive. And Augur is not a first prediction system, right? Prediction market has been there for 25 years, 30 years, and most of the system failed, and largely because of censorship. Uh, they were shut down by the government, um, uh, or they were being censored or manipulated the results. So that's a really interesting attempt on solving that problem. Um, so, like applying some of the MVC structure that we talk about, when you think about Augur, uh, there's a couple layer components. You have the theorem, uh, the basis consensus layer, uh, which says maintain different states. Now, on top of that, Augur writes its own code, of Ethereum code, serpent or whatever code, and uh, basically trying to define what is the logic for creating a new betting, how do people place bets. That's the controller layer, right? And then you have the model layer, which maintains who wins what outcome, how many bets has been placed, that's the model. All of these are consensus critical, right? It cannot, should not be and cannot be easily manipulated by any single party. Now, outside that, you also have certain logic that are not really consensus critical. Like, for example, uh, you have a little Augur mobile app on your iOS that allows you to check your bets every five minutes, right? That kind of app is not really consensus critical. It's just a local rendering of the results or a bar chart, right? These things are not really, it's part of decentralized application package, but it's not really a, a consensus critical. It doesn't need the voting or the consensus of the rest of the network. So that's probably how you would want to kind of analyze what would make a, uh, a D app. Um, one more example, uh, one name. So one name is a identity layer. Um, and we would talk a lot about the privacy problems that are introduced by centralization of all these internet um, you know, large companies, Google, Facebook, and one name I think is one interesting attempt trying to um, decentralize that. Um, so what they do is something very simple. They create a uh, name value pair layer on top of the uh, name coin. So name coin is one of the alternative coins. Uh, but they interestingly kind of merge mine with Bitcoin, meaning some of the Bitcoin miners also mine Namecoin, which gives it extra security level that otherwise would not have. Um, so OpenName basically puts some data, some arbitrary name value pair data on top of Namecoin. Uh, there's an example here, who's the founder. So there's a name, you have a location, you have his Twitter handle, you have the website's contact and his public key or Bitcoin um, you know, public, public key. Uh, or he's a PGP, etc. And open name auth is an actual product which allows you to sign in or authorize certain behaviors. So instead of logging as Facebook, which we use every day, uh, we do not, we don't need to rely on Facebook in identity. All we need to rely on is that the name coin or the Bitcoin blockchain would exist for a long time, right? So you would not be subject to any. What if the government asked Facebook to manipulate identity, or you know, things kind of could happen? Um, so you know, one name is trying to decentralize that. So um, that's one name. And lastly, um, Coinify. So that's another example. So we're kind of a, a meta layer on top of all these interesting D applications. So what we do essentially, our first application is really to crowdfund for different D application developments. So all these great about the app and all, all of them need money to fund them. So, so our approach is we essentially tokenize um, all of the software licenses 
um, are distributed and recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so I'll give a few examples. The last project we did was Get Gems. So they are a cryptocurrency messenger. There are four people, five people, I think, startup, uh, Israel startup. And they develop this messenger that allows you to transmit Bitcoin, but also chats, like kind of like in WhatsApp or Telegram. Um, and they were uh, doing basically a software license sale of their, their product. And all of these sales are recorded on, uh, were recorded on the Bitcoin blockchain using a protocol called Counterparty. So a Counterparty is a meta protocol on top of Bitcoin. And they allow you to basically create any arbitrary tokens. And we create a GMZ, GEMS token, that essentially represents um, you know, the ability to, to use the software and transmit uh, values in the network. Um, we also did, uh, right now I think it's going on, uh, with Factum. We raised about $400,000 and it's still counting uh, for, for Factum. So that's another use of how do you record software licenses essentially on, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, let's see. Okay, so to summarize a little bit. Um, so we talked about the MVC model, we talked about the consensus driven. Uh, what are the toolkits that if you guys wanted to build application that you can use? Um, at, the, at the very top, you have, you have a couple of different perspectives of the view. Um, how do you create an application, a web layer, that you could connect to these um, um, blockchains? Uh, you have the notarization, meaning logging in certain data. You have tokenization, and also program logic. Uh, file storage. We didn't talk too much about file storage previously, but file storage is instead of storing at a central Dropbox location or AWS S3, can we make the file storage or any type of data storage more decentralized, so they're replicated, redundant, etc. Uh, there are a bunch of projects that attempted to solve that problem. Um, so, so as you can see, the errors, um, I'm not sure, Robert, do we have an error session? Okay, cool, awesome. So Paris is a really interesting stack that attempts to kind of glue together all the different stacks. So instead of you have to learn all the different stacks, they give you a JavaScript framework that allows you to kind of integrate and use all the different stack, a layer of the stacks. Um, so, and it's a combination of basically Ethereum chain, uh, they use a fork of Ethereum chain, uh, they combine, I think, um, a JavaScript framework called, in, on top of their own uh, server called dserver. Um, and they also allow you to use the file store type IPFS. You can also use your JS to talk to um, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, name point, et cetera. Now, if you want to use specifically some of the properties, uh, for example, Factum. Factum is a combination that you could do any type of notarization. Um, you could also do any type of tokenization. They're essentially kind of a subset of each other. Um, if you only want to use the tokenization part, you could use Counterparty. So Counterparty is a very easy protocol that you could just create any tokens. Create gold. You could create um, um, securities, etc. Um, now, that doesn't mean they solve any of the actual binding of the securities. Like, if I create a token of Apple stock, that doesn't really mean anything, right? Obviously, there's certain legal parts that need to be built in to um, to kind of connect the two. Um, you also have Hyperledger, which does something similar. Um, now, Ethereum is a you know super ambitious project that attempts to solve many of the different layers of problems. Um, and then you have the, the Bitcoin blockchain itself. Uh, which stands as an organization layer or tokenization. Um, and then you also have the programmable logic layer, uh, like Coldius. So they kind of specifically target to provide you a Turing complete language that you can program any smart contracts uh, across different multiple parties. Um, and for the file storage, I strongly encourage you to check out IPFS project. Uh, one of my favorite projects, and I, I hope, I think Juan is going to give a talk. The founder of uh, IPFS is going to do a talk on that. So they basically essentially use DHT, which is one of the underlying technology of BitTorrent, um, and a bunch of other uh, stacks to provide you a decentralized file system uh, with the concept of, I think, a content-centric networking. So instead of uh, saying, okay, this machine stored that server, stored that file, and um, you know, imagine a file is stored 1,000 miles or 10,000 miles away from you, why do you go all the way to traverse the whole globe to retrieve that file, right? So content session network is more about what exactly is the content of that file. So I would identify that by hashing. So I know that image is there and it could replicate itself. So you could kind of like this global CDN in some extent. So, um, so yeah, so that's kind of the distributed toolkit. Uh, and I think a lot of these things would be really, uh, you'll find really useful and handy once you start thinking about being your own decentralized application. Um, in fact, I think it might be worthwhile to introduce uh, one more project, Spurzel. Um, our last uh, group's uh, alumni, Patrick Boots. Do you want to give a few words about um, Spurzel? We'll do that in a second. Yeah. Okay. He's scheduled. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay.
So that's pretty much it. Uh, this is your toolkit. And uh, here's my contact. Um, I, um, my company, Coinify, is based in here together with SkewChain. So um, I'm pretty, I have pretty open office hours on Wednesday and Saturday. If you guys um, have any questions, want to discuss any, brainstorm any group projects, I'm happy to provide um, um, any input. So thank you. Good